Yes, sir. All right, we'll be in Jeremiah 6. Uh, uh, verse 1 starts with, O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet of Tekoa and set up a sign of fire at Beth Hatserim, for evil appeareth out of the north and great destruction. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. The shepherds with their flock shall come unto her. They shall pitch their tents against her round about. They shall feed every one on in his place. Prepare you war against her. Arise and let, the, let us go up at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. Arise and let us go by night, and let us destroy her palaces. For thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees, and cast them out against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy oppression in the midst of her. As a, as a fountain casteth out her waters, so she casteth out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is, is hurt in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, let my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the age with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and the wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Where, where they where. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and seek, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest of your souls. But they say, we will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet, but they said, We will not hearken. Therefore, hear ye nations, and, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto the, my words, nor my law, but rejected it. To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba, and that sweet came from far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lay a stumbling blocks, before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them, the neighbor and his friend shall perish. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold and bow in the spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses set in array as men for war against the O daughter of Zion. We have heard the fame thereof. Our hands wax feeble. Anguish hath taken hold of us, and pain is a woman in travail. Go not forth into the field, nor walk by the way, for the sword of the enemy and fears on every side. O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth, and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous, revolters, walking with slander. They are brass and iron, they are all corruptors. The bellows are burned, the lead is consumed of fire, the founders melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plugged away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. And uh, the title of my message today is found there in that last verse of Jeremiah 6, verse 30. And the title of the message today is the reprobate doctrine. The reprobate doctrine and, you know, uh, right there in Jeremiah 6.30, it says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord 
hath rejected them. And so one of the things that we should do is we should always let the Bible define itself. This is actually the first time you see the word reprobate used in the Bible. And this is, and in itself, it, it, uh, it uh, defines it. It says, reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Now, this is talking about how the Lord has rejected the way the people of Israel are talking. It's not necessarily talking about reprobate, how we're going to explain where, the, you know, they, they don't have an opportunity to uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been rejected because they, they, uh, they recognize not the Creator and those things. And we're going to go through that. But before we get into that, I just wanted to, the reason that we're touching on this subject more than anything is there's a big... Uh, contention amongst Bible-believing Christians that aren't hard-preaching churches, that this doctrine, number one, in uh, our modern day, was brought by uh, a few uh, preachers, specifically one by the name of Pastor Stephen Anderson, and then they attribute it to a group of individuals that they refer to as the New Independent Fundamental Baptist, uh, New IFB, and, you know, I don't know who who all is included or not depends on the circle you're talking to, whether they've heard of some of these guys or not. Uh, you know, I've met most of these guys that they're referring to either personally, uh, some of them I consider friends, some of them acquaintances, and some of them just people that I've uh, met and shook their hand and I've heard them preach. But one thing that uh, we can definitely know for sure is that this doctrine is, even though it's attributed to this new generation of hard preachers, as if it was something new. The Bible tells us there's no new thing under the sun. And the Bible also tells us in, in you know, the Bible was written, if the Bible says, the word says in Psalms that it was settled in heaven forever. Thy word is settled in heaven forever. So the Bible has been written before we even knew the Bible existed. Before my conscience came into existence, before I was even in my mother's womb, this doctrine has existed. This is an everlasting doctrine. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the first thing I want to just point out is that if it is attributed to a in group of individuals that preach hard, well, then so be it. But the reality is that this is just another biblical doctrine that you find in the Bible that's important. Now, why I preach this today specifically is that, you know, in the last four weeks, I've preached a series of sermons about the foundations of the faith. You know, we've talked about once saved, always saved. We've talked about, you know, baptism, after salvation, proper baptism, and what it can do for your spiritual life and walking in newness of life. We've talked about, you know, the pure Word of God, the incorruptible Word of God, and that we need the King James Version for the English-speaking people, and that we need one version because there's only one God. And then uh, we've talked about soul winning, you know, and the importance of soul winning and why we go soul winning. And it's not just about soul winning, but the Great Commission where we teach them and we, you know, disciple them and actually educate them. And we have to, you know, the Bible says that one of the qualifications of a pastor or of a preacher is to be, have the ability to be apt to teach. Well, in order to have the ability to teach, you actually have to have individuals who are willing to learn. So it's not just enough to go out soul winning and then just leave them there. But it's, it's also important to bring them into uh, the church to learn. Now, if we have a choice between having them attend church or believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll have them believe on the Lord Jesus Christ all day long. But at some point, even though we, the percentages are small, we will get people in church that will turn around and become soldiers for Christ. And what happens is that then these type of doctrines start to make a lot more sense. The reason I built it like that, or the reason that I preached it in that sense, is because the, the last sermon I preached was about soul winning. And one of the things that soul winning does is that, you know, you've heard me say it cleans up your life. It really gives you an understanding or a seal or a, 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 a compassion for lost people. But another thing that it does is that it makes you aware of why God preaches hard in the Bible why Jesus was such a hard preacher, why the prophets were so hard, is because you see out there as you knock door to door that there's a lost world. And not only that, that there's a lost world that has a lot of misinformation, and most of that misinformation comes from this type of individual, the reprobate. So the first thing I want to say is that this is not a, a term that I throw out loosely. This is not something that I attribute to anybody, even if I think that they're in, in this category. I'm going to try the Spirit before I even get there because my first duty is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, if I had a choice between preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ or 
talking about the reprobate doctrine. I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ all day long, but there is a time and a place for everything, Ecclesiastes tell us, and this is the time to preach the hard doctrines of, of the Bible. And this is a hard doctrine, and I think it's a hard doctrine, and honestly, it's because there's a lot of lazy Christians that don't go out there into the battlefield so they don't realize how bad it really is. You know, when you're in your circle of friends and you're in your little cocoon and all you see is other like-minded believers, whether it's watered down, but you see that they're not as bad as what uh, the world says it is, then you just don't think it's that bad. I mean, the way that I, uh, a good example of this is I remember uh, I grew up a, a Seventh-day Adventist and one of the things that they did is they had a, a youth groups. And, you know, my parents always encouraged us to go to youth groups. And the common, most common thing my parents always said is, well, it's so much better that you stay out late at night with your group of friends than you're out with another set of group of friends drinking and, and uh, you know, doing drugs and all kinds of getting into all kinds of mischief. The only challenge is that if you look at it from a biblical standpoint, it's just as bad to get together and not do anything than get together and go out and cause mischief. It would have been better to just get together to learn the gospel and then go out soul winning. You know, it, it, it didn't make any difference in the, in, uh, in the lives of other people whether I got together. You know, we've had, we had some good times. It was entertaining, but it was all vain and it was all unfruitful. And, and so that's kind of the, the, the gist of what happens with these churches is they just get in their cocoon and they think, well, as long as we're doing this, it's better than doing what the world does. But the reality is God says, look, you're all sinners. Your sin might not be as bad as murder, but it's still sin. It still separates you from God. And, and while you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs, you have a bigger responsibility in the fact that you are now uh, an ambassador for Christ. You are now someone who has the ability to sound the trumpet for salvation. Because those individuals that are out there doing wicked and evil things, I mean, they don't know any better, but you know better. So actually, it is worse for you, and the Bible actually alludes to that than for anybody else. But I just wanted to set that up because it's real important. You know, I think these, these, uh, these preachers that uh, are out there that are in, within my age group or this generation, I think it's great that they're preaching hard. I think it's great that they're preaching the, the, the Word of God in all its entirety, unfiltered, unfettered. And the other thing that also stands true is the Bible always says, God tells us that He always leaves us a remnant. And it, it holds true even now, as, as bad as things are, as, uh, as the scales are tipped in the favor of, of the world, it looks like, there's still a remnant that's going to hold true to the standard, to the Word of God. And so let's go ahead and just look here real quick. Before, uh, In the meantime, turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 4. But if you'll look here, I just wanted to give you three, I went to three different places. I wanted to prove that this is not that unique of a, of a word and that not that unique of a, uh, it's not like this old timey uh, belief system that all of a sudden people don't understand today. You know, I went to three different dictionaries online. I went to an old dictionary, the 1828 dictionary. I went to the Merriam Webster dictionary. And then I went to probably what I would consider one of the most liberal dictionaries with, uh, that does, that tries to keep, uh, you know, just normal words. I didn't, you know, urban dictionary, that's a whole other thing. but dictionary.com, and I just got the, the definition for reprobate. Now, I already told you the Bible defines the Bible, and we've already defined the word reprobate in Jeremiah 6.30, but let's just see what the, wor let's see what the world uh, says about reprobate, because, you know, I know that the world has changed words like gay. You know, gay, you find in the Bible, means happy, but now they use it to attribute it to homosexuals or sodomites, but that's not the case for a word like reprobate. You know, 1820 Dictionary says reprobate, is from Latin, uh, reprobata, uh, reprobatus, reprobo, to disallow, re, and probo, to prove. So it's not enduring proof or trial, not a standard of purity or fineness, disallowed, rejected. And here in my note, I have that reprobate just basically equals rejected. So, you know, it's just what God rejects or what we would reject. So, you know, if we kick somebody out of the church, we could in essence say, hey, those individuals are reprobate from the church, meaning they've been rejected from the church. They've been given up from partaking in any activities in the church. Now, in the context that we're going to be preaching the reprobate doctrine today is that they've been rejected or they've been given up 
to no longer have that ability to call upon the name of the Lord. But, you know, Merriam-Webster here, uh, the, the word reprobate for them just to condemn strongly or is unworthily, unacceptable, evil, to foreordain to damnation, meaning that, that uh, you know, to refuse or accept, reject, there's that word reject, it gets all capitalized, condemned, depraved. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to, there's more in between, but I just wanted to give you some, some background. And then dictionary.com has reprobate, and it's a, a noun, a depraved, unprincipled, or wicked person, a person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation. So the most liberal of the three actually understands what the reprobate doctrine means. I mean, this is not some foreign concept. This is not something that we're coming up with just to sound cool and stand out. This is biblical, and the world understands it. You know, it's not, uh, it's not a, a weird thing to say. It's like the other day I remember someone saying, you know, oh, I can't believe this day and age so-and-so uses the word fornication. People understand the word fornication. They know what it means. They know it's negative. They know it's sinful. And to this day, it's something that you shouldn't partake in. But I just don't want let's not digress. So reprobate is just the doctrine that's been taught through the generations, through the Bible, that it's where the, at the point where it, people, it, it's too late for people to get saved. So there comes a point where they've been given the gospel or the opportunity plenty of times, and they just no longer uh, take to it. And so God just gives them up, and that, that ability or that presentation is no longer available to them. You know, and the, the other thing that's important is not every time it's used in the Bible does it mean that it's beyond the point of salvation, for example, in, in Jeremiah 6.30. But we do have specific uh, times that it's used, and it makes, a strong, uh, uh, it makes a strong and firm case for it being rejected completely, and we're going to go through that. But let's go ahead and uh, just look. What You're there in Deuteronomy uh, 30, uh, I mean Deuter Deuteronomy 4, and we're going to be there in verse 1. And the very first thing I wanted to tell you is, I'm going to give you a list, and this is not an inclusive list, but I, I did, a, uh, you know, a, a, the list that I include here, I did it with the point of just making it simple. There's certain things and certain individuals you can call reprobates right away. So it's like reprobates that anybody can spot. Because then there comes a point where there's other individuals that might be giving you indications of some things, and it might look like that's the case, but we don't know. You know, and obviously only God can open up the heart of a man or a woman and know what's inside. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear when we're presenting this doctrine. You know, if we go there to Deuteronomy 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not... Add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye di diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal poor. For all the men that followed Baal poor, the Lord thy God had destroyed them from among you. But ye did that, but ye, but ye that did cleave, oh, but ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught, taught you statutes and, statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. And we see here that they added or took away from the word. And then if you just uh, turn to Revelation 22, and then we're going to be in Revelation 14, but Revelation 22, we see in verse 18, it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the, out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which were written in this book. And so you see here that these individuals that mess with God's word are reprobate. Now, I'm not talking about the individuals who maybe got saved and are using an NIV or are using a uh, new, new Living Translation or the message because, you know, that's what they had lying around the house or nobody's taught them or they're new to the faith. I'm talking about those individuals who have sat in those boardrooms or in those uh, committees and have 
willingly and consciously make changes to the Word of God, either for filthy lucre's sake or for promoting an agenda or just because of a satanic, I mean, because of a satanic agenda, because they, they don't recognize the Creator for who He is. They've rejected, they hate God, and they're doing these things. And the Bible is very clear that, if you, perv that you, uh, if you pervert the Word of God, if you're actively in that process, you know, this is a serious thing, then you uh, are a reprobate. And, uh, and you know, the references I'm making are, for example, I know, you know, I don't, I don't have the name off the top of my head, but one of the, the individuals that had a lot to do with the New International Version, she's still alive today. She's a lesbian that sits in a college that teaches all kinds of uh, homosexual studies. And, you know, the Bible is clear that that's a sin. And that wouldn't even make any sense. That's an oxymoron saying that, hey, a sodomite's going to help write the Word of God. God's Word is pure and nothing corruptible can touch it. So it, may, it wouldn't even make any sense that a corrupt person like that of a seared conscience would be able to have any input into God's Word. Because all we're really doing is preserving God's Word. If we ever translate into any other language or take it from the original uh, text, because the Word's already been inspired. It was settled in heaven forever. Let's look at another, uh, go back a few pages to Revelation 14, verse 9, and we're going to see that another uh, easy to spot reprobate, this one's in the future, will be uh, Revelation 14, verse 9, says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their tormented ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And so we see that in the future we'll be able to spot those reprobates right away. It's those who took the mark of the beast. Those who just, they're rejected because they've taken, I mean, this is very clear scripture that says, any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. You know, and they go hand in hand. And then this is the scary part. I mean, we were out sewing in earlier today and there was a young guy that we were talking to and he, may, he might have been maybe 16 at most. And, uh, and, you know, I asked him if he, if he were to die today, if he, uh, if he was 100% sure he'd go to heaven, and he said he didn't care. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying that guy's a reprobate because I am pre preaching on that, but what I told him was it's really sad because this is a part of Scripture whenever I see this, you know, in Revelation uh, 20, verse 10, and other Scriptures where you see this torment, this torment day and night. This is why it's so important to get to the people before they get to this point. Because the sad part is, you know, we're preaching on this doctrine so we can be able to spot them so we know what it is that we're dealing with. But the reality is we would much, much rather get to those individuals before they even got to this point. Before they even got to the point where God's given them up. Because regardless of how they live their life here, like I said, you know, last week, you know, whether you have the best life here or the worst life here, it's worse. Whatever we can imagine the worst thing we can imagine here, it's going to be worse in hell forever and ever. It says right there, the same shall drink of the wine of the, the wrath of God, which is poured out with mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their tormented ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. See, when you go soul winning, when you get the foundations of the faith, when you understand it's once saved, always saved, when you realize that it's through Jesus Christ, you know, and when you have a healthy fear of Christ, you realize this is not a position you want anybody in. And when you're out there door knocking, you see the lost, and you see how many people have misinformation, how many people believe that they're going to heaven because of good works, or they're going to heaven because they repented of their sins, or they're going to heaven because they did the sacraments. And, you know, you feel for them. There's compassion because you don't want anybody to be tormented forever and ever. They have no rest 
day or night. Have you ever met anybody um, or, or read the stories of individuals who just, you know, they're on their deathbed and, you know, they've, they've been through a, they have this chronic, just painful disease and they just have no rest day or night. You know, it, it, it would be, it's torture here on earth. Can you imagine this forever and ever and ever? I mean, the last week I've had a, a back pain from a back injury I had a couple months ago and it's hard to sleep comfortably and it's hard to be doing things during the day because you have that pain. Now I'm not comparing that to this at all. What I'm saying is if that's annoying, that's just an, a nuisance. Can you imagine if that just escalated a little bit more and all of a sudden it became torture day and night forever and ever. But let's not digress from the point we're here. So we've got a couple of people we can spot right away. A couple of reprobates that, you know, you just put it into perspective, you know, those that take the mark of the beast, those that pervert the word. And then the other one that you're going to hear a lot is, you know, the blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. And that's really just, that, that's the one that is probably the hardest. I mean, some people make it very clear, but then this is where we're going to start. And when I'm talking about those that are, that are easy to spot, you know, you got your false teachers, uh, those people that just proclaim that they just hate God, that there's no hope for them. They know it. You, you, if you're out so any long enough, or if you're out preaching the gospel long enough, you're going to run into these individuals and you know what I'm talking about. But here the Bible says in Mark, in the meantime, why don't you turn to Matthew 12. The Bible there in Mark says, uh, uh, in Mark 3, verse 28 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto you, the, unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And obviously that's just that point where they just, what's a good way to blaspheme something is to reject it. You know, to just uh, not, you know, obviously uh, to, to not take, take uh, not to listen to it, not to take it on, not to believe on it, to stay in a, in a state of unbelief. And let's go there to Matthew 12, uh, verse 30. It says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And so we see that this is a serious sin, you know, and, uh, you know, the Bible says that you can't get to the Father, but through Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus Christ, if we believe on him, then he leaves us the comforter. So if we don't have the comforter living in us, then we're in danger of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. So once again, you know, we should preach against the reprobates. We should preach this doctrine, but we should preach it as a, as a warning that we should reach those before they get there. And then the other part is we should preach against them so that we mark them, so that we separate ourselves from them because... They're beyond, uh, they're beyond saving. They're beyond hope. And it would be unfruitful or vain for us to go after uh, those individuals and waste our time, as many churches today are doing, you know, where they, uh, they're just bringing in those uh, sodomites and those false teachers and, you know, the ecumenical movement where they just think all religions are the same and they all lead to the same place. That's not the case. You know, that's not the case at all, and we need to be very cognizant. We need to be very aware of what is going on. So, yeah, even though on that list I said these are easy to spot, and when I, here I'm referencing, and we're going to tie it to, you know, those individuals who you know it's clear that they've rejected Jesus Christ. We do have a, and maybe, you know, I'm going to adjust my note here and say that there are individuals that we don't know when it comes to blaspheming the Holy Ghost. I mean, that's a, I'm not going to play God you know, and there we have, the Bible tells us that the tares are among the wheat. So we might have individuals that we, that we fellowship with, that go soul winning with us, that, that preach the gospel like us. And they're like Judas Iscariot, who was a reprobate, who was, you know, rejected, who, who uh, is not saved, who's been in hell for a long time. And so we have to be very careful of those things. Now, another one that is clear is the sodomites. And let me, make, let me just make a side note here. When I'm talking about sodomites, I'm talking about those queers, those homosexuals that partake in this lifestyle. They've sold out to this, this movement, this belief, this religion, really, of being just perverse and wicked. 
you know, I know that at times people have, they struggle with different things and, you know, they might, they, they, they might have been confused on certain issues because we're so bombarded with this information. I mean, you can't turn on the TV without seeing a, a, a sodomite on, on, a, on a TV show and you can't see, you know, all the, the, the news reporters, all of them look like effeminate little sissies. So, you know, I understand. I mean, uh, I grew up and I remember, you know, I didn't even know that my two sodomite uncles were sodomites until I was like 14 or 15 years old. And it was still not even clear to me then. I remember this is like 1994, 95. Uh, you know, they gathered our family around and sat us down and they told us that they were uh, coming out to us. And I mean, that was like a foreign concept to us. I mean, nobody knew what really coming out was. It, it's something that, that had gotten wind in the big cities. You know, I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley in McAllen, and before the age of internet, you know, there was a saying in the valley that we were always the last ones to get everything. You know, if there was a new fashion trend, if there was a new uh, movie, if there was a new anything, you know, I mean, you, you uh, younger generation are spoiled in the sense that, that uh, you know, when, um, when we were growing up, new movies would be promoted on television, and they wouldn't hit our theaters till like three or six months after they already had hit the big markets. Like now today, you know, you have video on demand and you can get them everywhere. You know, we're so, uh, we're so spoiled as a generation. Uh, you know, after we got done soul winning, uh, one of the brothers and I, we decided we wanted to get a smaller map of uh, the section here. Here in Houston, the, the section our, where our church is located is called Spring Branch. And we went to the two gasoline stations, an HEB and a Walgreens, and they don't carry maps anywhere anymore. You know, back then, you had to be able to walk into a grocery store and get a map because, uh, you know, trying to use maps on a flip phone is just non-existent, you know. And even before flip phones, even before cell phones, there was no uh, mapping system. I mean, you know, phones were still attached to the wall and there were still pay phones and things like that. But anyways, I, I was making more of a, uh, of a site. But the reason I'm making reference to that is because there's just certain things that the younger generation is never going to understand. They're never going to see, you know, uh, I remember... Uh, I grew up watching TV. I didn't get saved till I was 25, and I grew up, I was, I am part of the MTV generation. And I remember growing up, and there was a popular show that, that my brother and I would watch religiously, and it was called uh, The Real World. And I think the first series or first season came out like in 1995, and this is when reality TV was introduced into the mainstream media. And, when I, and, and by the way, if you know anything about television, um, it's all scripted, but we didn't have as much access to information back then, so they told us it was reality TV, and we thought it was real, and I remember it was either the first or second season, there was a, a, a fag, a queer uh, character in there, and they, what they would do is they would put all these people from different ethnicities and, and male and female in one big house, and they were like, and then we're going to put them together, and then I think the, the slogan was, and we'll see what the real, and we'll let the real world happen, and you know, obviously it was a bunch of young people that were trying to explore all kinds of stupid things. And, all, and, and these producers, these evil producers are promoting this stuff. But uh, long story short, it was filled with, you know, uh, uh, sexual, you know, uh, like they were, it was all just, and I, I don't want, it was filled with just planting bad ideas in you. You know, fornication, alcohol, drugs, you know, sodomy, just all the things that, that, uh, that you don't want to be exposed to now as an adult that is a Bible-believing Christian, and you don't want to expose your children. But, you know, this is, this is the generation we grew up in. I mean, my parents had no idea what we were watching. We sat there, and we just watched it and just ate it up. And then we wonder, you know, it is a miracle. It's only by the grace of God that we're even up here, that I'm even up here preaching the Word of God. But long story short, it was like the first or second season, I don't remember, but there were, they had a sodomite, a character, and he kissed his male partner on, on the TV, and that was the first time on television that this had happened, or at least, you know, here in the, in the States, maybe in other countries or whatever, but, and it was a big deal, and I remember there was all kinds of, uh, you know, 
conservative family groups from the right fighting it and trying to ban and the FCC get involved. And then there was all kinds of liberal groups saying, you know, it wasn't anything bad. And, then, and that started this decline in morality. And nowadays, I mean, who knows what's out there, but I know, you know, that's why I don't, we don't watch that stuff and we don't have it because uh, from what I hear, it's just wicked and it's not even, you know, that was just a small peck. Uh, who knows what kind of stuff they let on TV now. Think about the damage it's doing, but going back to the point here, you know, what I'm talking about is the, the, the out, the, the, the activist, the wicked, the agenda, the, the predator, the recruiter, sodomite. The active sodomite that says, this is my lifestyle, this is my agenda, and not only is it my agenda, but I'm going to bring as many people, I'm going to take down as many people as I can with me. And so that's an easy peasy, as we like to say. Go to Romans 1. This is the popular uh, reprobate uh, chapter, Romans 1, and we're going to touch on it a little bit more later. But this is the, the, the verses where it, it talks about the sodomite and the mentality that they get when they reject God. And so then what does God do? God then rejects them. See, most people think that you reject God and that you are somehow so powerful that you can tell God whether you're going to go to heaven or not. But it's not like that at all. God's always pr promoting the opportunities. As a matter of fact, thank God that we have multiple opportunities because there's been people that probably at some point in their life were angry with God or didn't understand. And maybe they thought they were rejecting God, but then somebody knocked on their door and presented them the gospel and they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm talking about these guys or these individuals, these men and women, are going out there and they're trying to even change the definition of a man and a woman and the definition of marriage and the definition of monogamy and the definition of just pureness and holiness. And, you know, they, they want to just defile the, 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 uh, the, the matrimony bed. You know, go to Romans 1, verse 26, says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. I mean, it's pretty simple. This is going to, at the end, in verse 28, it talks about the reprobate, and it gives us the, the guidelines for who they are. It says, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. It says, they, and we'll read a little bit here uh, later, all of it, but this is the cause, Right? And, you know, it's in verses 18 and 19 that he's given us that. I don't want to get ahead of my message, but it's like there is a cause. It says, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of that of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. You know, I remember growing up, and one of the frustrations for my, uh, my mom was when we were part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was that she would see these uh, leaders of the church, and they had ties to, you know, doctors and lawyers and all that, and they all had money, and they all had nice homes and drove nice cars, and she's like, See, you know, God doesn't love us because he takes care of them better than we do. And, you know, by the way, we always had a bunch of stuff. I was, I mean, I grew up a very average American uh, kid. I had, you know, there was, I, I never went, went for, you know, had any need for anything. I didn't grow up in poverty. I didn't grow up rich either. I, I think I was just a middle American, middle, uh, middle income American uh, teenager and even young adult. But, you know, you, Hispanics have a tendency to want to compare. And one of the things that, that, that you would see is, you know, they'd be driving these nice cars and they'd have these nice trips. And the one thing that I've learned from the Bible is that, you know, sometimes we better be careful when we see all that stuff because God might have just given them up. He's like, go, go at it. I'm no longer interested. And you've already condemned yourself. And, I mean, this is it. This is as good as it's going to get for them, you know. There was a, I think there was a slogan or a, a movement a couple years ago by these sodomites about how it gets better. But let me tell you something, it's never going to get better. As a matter of fact, the slogan should be, it gets worse. Because they're damned eternally for hell forever and ever to burn in their, they're no longer going to burn in their lust, they're just going to burn 
in hell forever and ever. And the thing that I want to preach today is that the reprobate doctrine should be preached in churches, that we should understand it, but the big thing is that we should go out there into the hedges and the highways to try to avert and impede others from reaching this point. See, it's my goal and my duty to want to preach the gospel to everybody so that we can avoid these. Now, for two reasons. Number one, by the way, I'm not, you know, if, if, if there is a, a, a reprobate or a sodomite or anybody in, you know, in, in the midst of me, I want to be separate from them. I'll call them out. And I, I don't want anything to do with them. But I also don't think that, you know, I wouldn't wish hell on my worst enemy. My worst enemy. God's enemies. That's a whole different story. You know, but if we can get to them before that point, that's great. Now, if we can't, then we definitely need to understand it so that we can preach against them, so that we can mark them, so that we can be separate, so that we can protect our families from them, so we can protect our congregations and our flocks from them, so we can protect those individuals that we're leading to Christ from them. Because you know what? There's a lot of people that we've led to the Lord, and instead of coming to our church, they're going to a church that's led by a reprobate. You know, I mean, when you're out there and we, we here in Houston, we have a clear example of a reprobate. We, his name is Joel Osteen. And when he's out there, you know, making the case for sodomites and for this lifestyle and for the fact that he doesn't preach against sin because God called him to do the good, you know, that's changing the word of God. That's not wanting to preach the entire word of God. See, you've got a responsibility to preach it all and to not pick and choose what you want to preach also. You know, so anyways, that's the sodomite. The other one that it's real easy to pick on, and that's why I jumped to it, is the false prophets, the false teachers. And I'm not just talking about those that get behind the pulpit. Nowadays, you have false prophets, you know, through social media, through just the media outlets, through YouTube, through Hollywood, through the movies, through even all these uh, movements where they've tried to Christianize the world. In other words, like you have Christian music that sounds like the world. You have Christian movies that sound like the world, but they're doing the same thing the world does. That, to me, is people that, are, that have an agenda and they know what they're doing. Those, those individuals are probably reprobate. You know, let's go to first, uh, I mean, go to Titus. I don't know what I'm saying. And keep your fingers there in Romans. We're going to go back to Romans 1. But go to Titus, Titus 1, verse 10. And I've got to hurry up here. Verse 10, it says, For there are many... Unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for, for filthy lucre's sake. And see, it just goes back to my point, whose mouths must be stopped. It says, one of them, verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow belly. So look, they know, this is saying one of them called the others out and said, look, they're liars, they're evil beasts, they're slow bellies. It says, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth, Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in their works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. In other words, it looks like they're doing good works. They look like Mother Teresa's. They look like the Pope Francis's of the world. They look like the Joel Osteen's of the world. But the Bible says that every good work reprobate. It's rejected because they have their conscience seared or defiled, as this verse, said, verse 15 said. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are the ones that we can easily spot. Now, I'm pretty sure, you know, I, I missed some here or there. There's, you know, the, the more you read the Bible, the more you just start to see things. It's amazing. The more you get into the Word, the easier it gets to spot some of these things. And so I'm pretty sure in a couple of years, I'll probably even get more specific as to the signs and the things that will come out. But this is, this is kind of what, what, what uh, was laid at my feet as I was reading the Bible, you know, as I was preparing for this message. Is, you know, you've got to look at those that pervert the word of God. Obviously, in the future, we'll know those that take the mark of the beast, those that blaspheme the Holy Ghost, the sodomites, 
you know, false prophets or false teachers in the church, and even those that are within the, the tares within the wheat, that just they might whisper or murmur and, you know, go in opposition to the word of God, you know. But here's the, the, the gist of it all. So what, what's the gist of the reprobate doctrine? Why even preach it? Well, because it, it's a serious thing. God rejects them before uh, they're fully rejected. By the way, I mean, it, it, it's not that, don't make it that difficult. Reprobates exist now. They're, they're all in hell. I mean, everybody who didn't get to heaven is a reprobate because God's rejected them and put them in hell. So the idea here is twofold. Let's get to them before they're reprobate so that they're not rejected here on earth. I mean, uh, as I heard it say the other day, a dead man walking, but so that, uh, and, and they're not in hell forever. But the other one is, like it said there, so that you know, we can stop their mouths, so that we can call them out, so that we can uh, you know, uh, warn the congregation, so that we can protect the flock and protect our families from them. In Romans 1, verse 18, now we can go and see just a little bit more of what the cause is when I was talking about Romans 26. Romans 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I mean, they're holding the truth. I just, I'm very visual, but imagine righteousness is something you hold and they're holding it in unrighteousness. They're defiled. They're unclean. They're not even worthy of, of holding the truth. It says, because that they which may be known of God is, man the, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So this whole thing of people who don't believe in God, the people who are questioning their faith or trying to find themselves or, you know, was the Bible written by man? You know, can God really preserve his word? You know, it, does God, is how, you know, why are you making up this mythical creature that exists in your mind so you can feel better about yourself? All the arguments that atheists and scientists and evolutionists use, you know, the Bible is very clear. Look, you're there. You're without excuse. There is no excuse. It's visible to you. It's clear to you. You know in your hearts of heart. As a matter of fact, when you reject it like that, you're not only, uh, you're not, you're a blatant liar is basically what you are. You're a blatant liar. And if you're out there promoting it and trying to convince others, not only are you a liar, but you're a blatant deceiver. Because now you're not only lying to people, but you're trying to convince them of that lie. And it says there in, in verse 21, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Who darkened their heart? God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, so that's the cause, God gave them up to, unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use to that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, a rejected mind, to do those things which are not convenient. See, it, it's not a natural thing for me to want to lust after another man. Now, I am human, and the possibility always exists that I could lust after another woman. But that's why I have the Bible to keep me on the straight and narrow. But that's a natural thing. You know, I'm a man. And, you know, I'm attracted to my wife. Before my wife, I was attracted to women. And even now that I'm attracted to my wife, if I don't do the things that God has asked me to do, the temptations could be there, that there could be an attraction to something else, right? But not to another man. That's not natural. It feels unnatural. It's, it's, uh, it gives you the heebie-jeebies. It's disgusting. But here it says that they left the natural use. They did something unnatural. You know, it says in, uh, 
in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, <coughs> excuse me, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that in in them that do them. In other words, it says there, <coughs> excuse me, that they know the judgment of God, and they, they know that they're worthy of death, and they take pleasure in it. And let me tell you something. I was not saved until I was 25. And this is something that I'm not proud of, something that I rarely talk about anymore as an adult, but it's perfect for this situation. Uh, I worked for six months at Disney World. I was in this thing called the college program. So I was in college, and they come and interview a bunch of college students. And at the age of 20, I uh, took a semester off to go to this thing called college program so you could learn how to be a great business person according to, business, according to Disney marketing and you know, basically indoctrination. And at that time, this is in 2000 before it really took off, I think 60% of the workforce for Disney World at that location was sodomites. And the place where we went was uh, you know, this set of apartment complexes where they set up a bunch of young people with no rules, no anything, and they gave you free will to do whatever. And uh, by the way, I just want to, I've always, my parents grew, gave me a lot of uh, moral rightness. I wasn't saved, but you know, so I knew a bunch of the stuff there was wrong and I kept to myself. So I just want to make it clear. It's not like I was uh, out there, you know, partaking all this, but you know, at the same time, I also wasn't a saint. I'm just going to say, but none, none of this was unnatural. It's just stupidity. But the one thing that was really stupid and dangerous and God, you know, protected me from it or common sense or whatever was there was a lot of sodomites. And there was things that, you know, all of these in here, they're there. I mean, they really are like this. They're not like will and grace. You know, I grew up and I think that, that was one of the first openly sodomite TV shows that came out. My brother and I watched it when we were young teenagers. You know, and they sell you these these two cool guys who just, you know, they're very loving and they care for everything. That's not the way it is at all. It's a disgusting, perverse, wicked, vile lifestyle. It's, it's utterly from the pit of hell. It's just trash. And if you ever spend any time around these individuals before you were saved, I mean, if you, if you spend time with them now, just run the other way. The Bible says to be separate from them. The Bible's clear enough. This, this list here should be enough to keep you away from individuals like that. This list here should be enough for you not to go messing with fire, for you not to go play with that, because there's nothing fruitful about those individuals. And I remember shortly after that, so I've, I've witnessed it firsthand, you know, in, in that realm. And I'm not talking, you know, witnessed it firsthand as in like, you know, we, we saw the, it's just that we, if you were, you're around that workforce, because I want to make that clear, you know, I witnesses for hands and like, they're there and they have a wicked agenda. You know, they have this thing called June Day or Red Day. And, you know, it's like a secret, basically sodomite holiday for Disney where they allow all these sodomites to come in unannounced and families are there with their kids and these guys are doing perverse things, you know, and they're constantly trying to get you to come to parties and, you know, partake in all kinds of things and do kinds of things. So, I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't, if you don't act on it, then you're not going to see the worst of the worst, but it doesn't take a rocket science to hear some of the stuff that comes out of their mouth and then just, you know, the next step just is that much worse. And the step after that is just even worse than that. And then after that and after that. So, you know, it's just best stay completely away from it. Preach against it. Keep your family safe. Keep your congregation safe. And number two, you know, preach the gospel so that people can avoid this lifestyle. Because... I mean, God gives them up to vile affections. They think they're living the life. 
it's a horrible lifestyle. Most people die these sad deaths from disease and from just, you know, murder and deceit and betrayal and backstabbing, all this stuff. And then immediately after that, they're in hell forever and ever because, uh, you know, they rejected God. Now it's on them. But what if somebody knocked on their door, you know, before they went out into the world? What if somebody knocked on their door at age 17 or 18 before they left their home and went to college and got indoctrinated? What if somebody said, look, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you'd be going to heaven? Because, you know, one of the things that God says is he'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. That means that he's going to protect you from this lifestyle and from these wicked individuals. Now, can we get uh, backslidden? Can we, fall, can we fall prey to, you know, maybe some weird doctrines? Of course, but he will protect you from the harder things in life. I mean, we have to believe that because God says he will never leave us or forsake us. And, I mean, sometimes he protects us by just taking our life sooner. If we're not being uh, fruitful and we're not being, you know, there is a sin unto death, the Bible says. So this is an important doctrine because we have to preach against it when you're out there in the, in the battlefield, when you're out there in the trenches, you see it. And I mean, the laborers are so few that sometimes if we're not knocking the door, I mean, hopefully they'll show up to church one day and maybe this is the sermon they hear. And all of a sudden it clicks. And they no longer have to worry about that. And then they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe they, they change their life around. You know, I tell people all the time, I mean, I got saved at the age of 21, I mean, uh, 25. And now I have, uh, you know, I got started later in life with children. I have two young children. And my daughter, when she first started uh, uh, saying my name, Daddy, she said Dodo. So she's been calling me Dodo for a long time. And I know most people think of Dodo Bird or it's a negative thing. But the Bible says that, you know, Dodo was the, uh, the father of one of David's mighty men. You know, and that's another sermon for another day. But those mighty men weren't mighty for just because they were good at battle. I mean, that's the main reason. But, you know, David was a man after God's own heart. So I would love to be Dodo, the father of my son, who would be a mighty man for Christ. But the only way that we're going to do that is if we have people who are preaching the entire Word of God, every doctrine, whether it's fun or not. And let me tell you something. These are, this is the type of, of sermon most people don't like. You know, all the other sermons leading up to this one, probably most people will watch them and like them. And even if they don't like me, that you know, I didn't say anything that maybe is too offensive. But I'm telling you right now, you can take, you know, several minutes from each one of uh, these sections and people would definitely get offended. You know, uh, who am I? I'm a nobody, but who's God? Well, they hate Jesus. And they hate Jesus with all their might, with all their soul. They just, they despise him, it says here. So let's go to John 12, because uh, I'm running out of time. But let me just give you a couple other verses that tie this all together, because most people would focus on Romans 1, and we should focus on Romans 1. But there's other ways that God has said that they're rejected. You know, that's all it means. And God uses a lot of synonyms in the Bible to to make sure he gets his point across. Because, you know, he knows that we are hard-headed. We're stiff-necked at times. You know, John 12, verse 36 says, While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles, uh, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. So in other words, Jesus has done a lot and they still don't believe, you know, you're knocking, and you're knocking, and you're knocking. Eventually, they're just like, they don't believe, right? It says that the, that the sayings of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which, spake, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw the when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. In other words, there's peer pressure. But the thing that's important is that who hardened their heart? God did. You know. I hear people all the time saying, well, how can it be once saved, always saved? Well, what if I reject God? Look, Bible says that you're in his hand. You can't reject God any more than, than uh, I don't know, you can reject, you can, you can stop your own heart from beating, that you can stop your involuntary functions from being involuntary. 
I mean, God is God and He is almighty and all powerful. There's no way. He says you're in His hand, you're in His hand. If you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the other thing that people say is, well, you know, I can reject Him. No, you've rejected Him enough, but now He's turned around and He's hardened your heart to where even if somebody did knock on your door, the situation won't, won't progress. It won't go forward because you're not going to believe. He's blinded your eyes. He's, he's shut your ears. It's just not available. And there is a time for everybody. I don't know what that time is. The Bible doesn't tell us. I don't know if it's one time, two times, ten times. I would like to think that uh, based on what we see, that it's probably different for everybody because everybody's unique. But don't mess around with that time frame. You know, today is the day of salvation. Proverbs 1, verse 20 and then uh, we'll be in Hebrews, and I'll close out for the sake of time. But Proverbs 1, verse 20, see, these are some of the, the main <clears throat> uh, scriptures where we see this clear rejection of people. You know, I was talking to someone that's close to me that I actually believe is a reprobate. And I wish, I, you know, I pray that they're not. But based on these things, uh, based on this, these set of scriptures, I actually believe that, and, it's, and it saddens me because they've had opportunities. And I mean, I'm talking, this goes back to the time when I was five years old. And I thought that that, and I remember shedding tears for that individual at a Baptist, at a Baptist church. This is before, long before I knew Baptists and Adventists and all that. But I remember somebody preaching about hell. And I remember turning to someone and saying, hey, is this individual going to go to hell? And shedding tears for that individual. And then as I've gotten older, you know, now that I've, I've been able to preach the word to that individual, um, I just, now I get mockery. I, 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 you know, they avert it. They, they always kind of change the subject. It makes me think, are they, have they lost that chance? Has God blinded them? Has God hardened their heart? And if so, then that's going to be a sad day to realize that. That the day that they die, it's not the final death. They're going to the second death. You know, Proverbs 1.20 says, Wisdom crieth out with, without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. Verse 21 of Proverbs 1, She crieth in the chief place, of concourse in the openings of the gates in the city she uttereth her words saying how long ye simple ones will ye love simplicity and the scorners delight in the score in their scorning and the fools hate knowledge turn you at my reproof behold i will pour out my spirit unto you i will make known my words unto you because i have called and you refused i have stretched out my hand and no man regarded but ye have said at naught all my counsel and with none of my reproof I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as the whirlwind, when distress, distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For, they, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not... They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. And we see this is a picture of, you know, Christ reaching out to them. This is wisdom, you know, the the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. And it says that, that they chose, did not choose the fear of the Lord. That means they couldn't get that knowledge, for they hated knowledge. If you hate knowledge, you hate the Lord, because the only way to get knowledge is through the Lord. And what does he do? He laughs at their calamity. He doesn't respond to them. He doesn't even acknowledge them. And we know that it says, uh, you know, many came to him, and they professed all these things. He says, turn from me, for I never knew you. You know, he doesn't know them at all. This is a serious thing, you know, and for the sake of time, we can close out on this right here on Proverbs 1. But I would much rather deal with the scorns of the world and go out there and preach the Word of God in its entirety. You know, because there's, there's times when we knock on a door and someone listens and we give them the Romans road and we give them the gospel and they pray and they call upon the name of the Lord. But there's some people that are more hard-headed. And you know what? This is the type of sermon that might stir them. That, that, that might just get that fear of the Lord. They might be teetering that line between fully rejecting Him and not. And we don't know what their last opportunity is. You know, there's so many uh, serial killers in America now. There's so many mass murders. There's so many mass shootings. And I really think the challenge is, 
And the problem is that we worship death through the media, through Hollywood, through the school systems, through the indoctrination. So it's good for us to get some good, hard doctrine from the Bible that tells us two things, and that's what I want to close out. The two things I want to leave you with today is the reprobate doctrine is as old, I mean, it's everlasting. God's, God had no beginning, no end, so the doctrine has been around that long. And the two things that it's for is for us to reach the people before they can get to that point. But if they're at that point, then it's for us to speak out against it, to preach against it, to rebuke them sharply, and also to protect our congregations, our family, our friends, those that we love and we care for, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach uh, your word, Lord, and uh, I, I pray that it, it was your words and not mine that came through. I pray that the set of uh, uh, sermons have helped build the foundation that we will build upon to preach even deeper and uh, uh, wider truths, uh, more meat of the word and uh, than the milk of the word, Lord. But uh, I just pray that uh, it, it did something for those that are listening today and for those that will listen in the future, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for helping us just continuously grow and uh, be uh, strong. And Lord, help us to spot those reprobates and speak against them. But also, Lord, help us to reach those lost so that we can reduce the number of reprobates, so that we can reduce the number of rejected. Because at the end of the day, Lord, you know, they call it, uh, I think they call it clickbait. You know, when you put this stuff on YouTube and people, you know, you, you preach certain sermons that get, it's not about that, Lord, at all. It's about the loss. And this life is fleeting and, you know, everything just passes by. And one day uh, you're popular, someone one day you're not. One day someone notices you, one day not. But the one thing that we know is those that are saved, you notice every day. You've numbered their, the, the, hair, uh, the hairs on their head. And for those that uh, don't know these things and for those that have never had the opportunity to have a clear gospel presentation, Lord, may it be presented to them so that, uh, the possibility of not being rejected is there. And if they are, Lord, so that we can just move on to the next person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.